Welcome to the Pearson Center's 34th webinar on the broad theme of COVID and beyond, and today a special conversation with Peter Mansbridge. My name is Francesca Iacorto, and I'm a board member of the Pearson Center. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs at the National Airlines Council of Canada. As many of you will know, the Pearson Centre is a progressive think tank that has, since April, been pursuing a very big project called COVID and Beyond, recognizing that we have a lot of issues to address as we plan for the recovery and rebuilding that will be slow and long. This is also an important time to reimagine Canada and think big. In that context, it is my very real pleasure to introduce our special guest today, Peter Mansbridge, who is one of the best and most respected journalists in Canada. He is best known for his role with The National on CBC as chief correspondent and then as anchor. He has received over a dozen, dozen national awards for broadcast excellence. His first book, Peter Mansbridge One on One, was a bestseller. And today he is here to talk about his second book, Extraordinary Canadians Stories from the Heart of Our Nation. Uh, and Peter has graciously agreed to take questions uh, from the audience. So please use the question box on your screen and he will get to as many questions as we can before we end around 12.40 p.m. Eastern. And Peter will of course be in conversation with Andrew Cardozo, who's the president of the Pearson Center and a columnist with the Hill Times. So on that note, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Francesca, and uh, welcome, Peter Mansbridge. It's a real pleasure and an honor to have you here today um, and a chance to talk about this wonderful new book. Um, le uh, let me first ask, I want to make sure we get a good visual of that. Um, let me first ask you, uh, it's, it would seem to me that somebody at this stage in your career, you'd want to write an autobiography, but you've chosen to write about other people instead. What? Uh, tell us your, your thinking behind that. Well, I don't want to put aside the possibility of writing some form of memoir, although Good. I don't like the title. It kind of sounds like an end of life title, you know, I, uh, but I, I think there, there are different ways of approaching that. And I, and, and I'm sure that I will do that at some point. However, uh, I wasn't in the mood to write about myself this year. I wanted to talk about others. Uh, and it, in many ways, it was, it was what I traced in my career as a journalist. And Andrew, you, you, You'd understand this, I think. I mean, I've had the opportunity over 50 years uh, in, in the business of interviewing a lot of famous people, you know, celebrities, whether yeah. they're in politics on Parliament Hill or whether they're presidents or prime ministers or leaders of uh, various faiths, rock stars, hockey stars, you know, you name it. Um, and those have all been interesting. I've enjoyed all of those. But what I found most enjoyable and most rewarding really was talking to people who weren't generally known a kind of you know we we use this term perhaps too much but ordinary people caught in extraordinary circumstances um and so that's what i was looking for here and along with my co-author mark bulgich that's how we came up with our list and um, we knew some of these people would be known to some degree but most are not what uh, united them in many ways was they all faced different challenges I mean, the beauty of this book is it's diverse in so many ways. It's diverse by geography. There are 17 Canadians from all different parts of the country, different backgrounds, different cultures, different professions, different challenges that they faced in their life, uh, and different gender. So that was the that was the goal here was to you know get a snapshot of really the country in through the profiles of these people. So it's, it's as much a story about them as it is also about us really and about the country as it is today yeah yeah and so they're in, in some ways they're they're kind of ordinary but have lived extraordinary lives and done extraordinary things yeah absolutely that's it in a nutshell yeah um i'd love to talk about all of them but i i i've, I've chosen three i want to ask you about um and i've and partly because i've i've heard and know a little bit about them but I really find it fascinating to, to read more about them and learn more about them. So let me first ask you about Dr. Cindy Blackstock. Uh, we know her in her role with the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. Uh, you talked about her growing up in Northern uh, BC, um, mm -hmm. 
her father was Gitsan and her mother was white. And so she had insight into those two worlds. Uh, tell us a little about, about, uh, about Cindy Black's talk and what you found out. Well, you're right, especially working on, uh, you know, Parliament Hill, like you do, uh, Andrew, the, you, you get to see Cindy Blackstock every once in a while because she's so involved in Indigenous issues, and especially as they rate, or relate to uh, to young kids. Um, I'd interviewed her, I guess, about five years ago when I was at the National, and I was struck by her at that time as this really quite an incredible person, uh, and, and so focused on the issues that mattered to her. Mattered to her. Um, so as soon as we started this book, I said, I want, to, I want to learn more about Cindy Blackstock. So I phoned her up and it began a series of, of conversations that we had over uh, a couple of months. And that fact that you raised was what struck me very much because what, what, the way I write, I like to look for moments in a person's life and try and draw a thread through them to where those people are now or what they've accomplished during their lives. So when she started talking in our conversations very early about her early childhood, so we're talking like three, four or five years old. When she started explaining this, the nature of the family unit, which was a uh, non-indigenous mother and an indigenous father. Uh, he was in, he was kind of like a fire ranger uh, in the forests of uh, the interior of BC. And what she found uh, very early, okay, so we're talking at, at that era, at that age of a, a young kid who doesn't really sort of see the differences going on around them until they do see the differences going on around them. And this is what she saw. She saw that the treatment she had if she was out with her mother was very different than the treatment she had when she was out with her father. And as soon as she told me that, I saw the thread develop right through to where she is today in terms of her concerns about the inequalities that are faced by young Indigenous kids. Um, and you know, I I started my career in the late 60s in northern Manitoba, so I saw a lot of things as it related to the Indigenous community that I wish I'd never seen. Uh, they were difficult to watch. Um, and yet she'd grown up in that kind of a situation. And she wanted to make a difference and has made a difference in the lives of, of so many others. So all the rest of the stories in the segment on Cindy come out of that early moment, uh, you know, as, as a young child. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so, I, you know, I love that part of a part of her story. So the, the, other, the thing I found intriguing about the book is, is you're writing about these 17 people, but it's all written in the first person. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about why you chose to do it that way. Well, that was actually, um, that wasn't our idea. That was Simon and Schuster's idea. They kind of threw it out there as an idea. Why don't you consider doing doing it this way? And both Mark and I kind of looked at each other, going, "Hmm, <laughs> we've never done that before." Uh, it's a bigger task. Not, it's a huge yeah, task. It is yeah. in a way, but then under the the same time, it was kind of easier in a way. I mean, right. however we went about this book, it was going to involve a lot of interviews uh, with with the keepers. Um, so. What happened here is we talked to the, you know, we talked to individuals like with Cindy. I talked to her a couple of times, got the transcripts, went through everything, then looked for what I didn't know. And so, you know, it, it meant going back and interviewing again and again. Um, but basically, I had all the words. I knew the story. It was then a matter of, you know, like, what are you going to put where and how are you going to draw a thread through all of this? Um, yeah. So it was it was different, and it was initially a challenge, but it became kind of nice actually to be able to write it this way, which I'd never thought of before. Yes, it's got a really personal touch to it. That way, apart from the fact you're talking about a person, that there's sort of an added personal touch in their own words. Um, let, let me ask you about the next person on my list, who's Frances Wright, a leading feminist. Um, mm -hmm. One of her key roles has been, or, or accomplishments, has been. Um, getting the uh, statues assembled, uh, established on 
Parliament Hill and in Calgary to commemorate the person's case and the five women who, who led the person's case. Um, and I, I, I do want to do a quick shout out to Isabel Metcalf, who's mentioned in your book as one of the, the group who worked with her and Francis Wright, Isabel and others uh, worked behind the scenes to ensure that the House of Commons would agree to the statue happening. Can you tell us a, a little bit about Frances Wright and why you chose her? Well, you've pretty well nailed it, uh, why we chose her, because, you know, what she managed to accomplish, and she's the first to ensure that other people are recognized in this. She's, you know, very humble, as all these people were that we talked to in this book. None of them were looking for publicity. None of, none of them called us and said, hey, I'm extraordinary, talk to me. It was quite the opposite, actually. Most of them would say, hey, there's nothing extraordinary about me. I'm just I'm just a gal, I'm just a guy, I do my thing. And we'd say, no, 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 you're, you're extraordinary. We want to talk to you more. And it was the same with Francis, who's always giving credit elsewhere um, beyond herself. But look, there's no doubt in my mind that um, the accomplishments that have been made on part of the famous five um, in today's world, which include the, the two uh, statues you mentioned, especially that one on Parliament Hill, uh, would not have happened without her, without her, you know, uh, lobbying all the right people, sometimes the wrong people, but learning through that who the right people were and making uh, the accomplishment of, uh, of, of having the signature uh, place on Parliament Hill uh, to honor the women who moved women really into the modern era. Um, you know, when you consider who the statues are of Parliament Hill, and now suddenly this one, and I, you know, that's when I first met Francis because we covered that event live uh, on the CBC when the statue was unveiled. And I can't remember which year it was, it was about 10 years ago at least. And um, and you know how special she was then so when i got an opportunity to do this i mean she also led the, a much more recent charge in you know in changing the words uh in the national anthem right. uh, with, uh, by son's command um and uh, you know she's uh, she is a pretty special pretty remarkable person um who when she's focused on what the challenge ahead is man there's there's no stopping her um, and, you know, in, in that way, she shares the same kind of values, although the, the issues are so different with all the other people in the book. They are confronted by a challenge. It may be a, an issue like, like uh, Francis did, or it may be, you know, a disease. It may have been an accident. It may have been an issue of race. Uh, any number of different situations where they decide, you know what, I can make a difference here, and I'm going to make a difference. And uh, that's what Francis has done on, on more than a few things. Okay, uh, and third, uh, and, and I think one of and one of the great things about that stat the statue or the series of statues is that it's the first women who had statues on Parliament Hill besides the Queen, because as you mentioned, all the other statues were were our leaders from the past were all men. Um, the third person I want to ask you about is Rabbi Reuven Bolka. Um, Peter, you have uh, hosted Remembrance Day ceremonies uh, for many years, uh, with you know, with with, with really the um, the degree of honor and solemnity that that it required. Um, Rabbi Boka was the is the uh, Domin he's the honorary chaplain of the Dominion Command of the Royal Canadian Legion, uh, which resulted in him being uh, at the ceremony and speaking every year. Uh, tell us a bit about him, please. Well, he too is uh, worthy of the title extraordinary. Um, in his case, this was Mark's idea, my co-author, Mark Bulgich, uh, to do the rabbi. And Mark was, you know, worked with me at the CBC for 30 years. He was, among other things, the executive producer of news specials, which meant programming like Remembrance Day. So Mark said to me earlier in this process, he said, you know, Sitting in the truck, which is where he would sit uh, on the satellite truck on, on location at Remembrance Day in Ottawa, he said, sitting in that truck all those years, I always saw the same person speaking on behalf of the Jewish faith, because all the different faiths are, are represented on Remembrance Day. And it's this rabbi. And, you know, um, I, I want to, he always 
gave such great messages and he was yeah, uh, so vibrant and energetic in, in, in telling his stories that I want to tell his story. And so um, he phoned him up and started a process uh, that, uh, you know, uncovers through this, the, the, the chapter on, on him in the, in the book, a remarkable life uh, with a family that has, has had a pathway that included you know, Auschwitz and, and, and uh, you know, other uh, markers of the Holocaust, right through moving from Europe to the United States and then to Canada and then to this this role he has now. And in each step and stop in the, along the way, uh, there are more challenges and more ways that he has faced them uh, through his energetic spirit. Uh, so he, his too, you know, it sounds boring, but his too is an extraordinary story, um, as they all are, but they're so different. And that's the beauty of it. This book doesn't, you know, it, it, it's chaptered from basically from one to 17, but you could start at any chapter. You know, you don't have to go follow the, the, the numbers in the book. You could start at the, you know, the 14th chapter and then go back to the third or whatever. You're not going to get mixed up because they're all so different and yet uh, so rewarding to read. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. Let, let me just share with you that, that I found about the book. One was the three people I've, I've asked you about, I knew a little bit about them. So it was a real treat to get a chance to read a lot more about them, and especially in the personal um, uh, style that you've written it. The other thing is a number of the others who I don't know, as I read through it, I could sort of remember occasions that I knew about, didn't know about them, but then you sort of talked about how they were relevant to something important. And and it's kind of neat to find that out where you sort of remember something happened that was really interesting, but you don't know who it was and you and you've exposed that. So so thank you for doing that. I, I want to go to a few uh, larger questions and I and I've seen we've we've got a few questions coming from the audience. I will ask you to send in your questions on the question box and we'll and we'll get to as many as we can. Um Peter, let me ask you about the the challenges that that Canada is facing. Um, what do you think? Do you think our leaders have what it takes to lead us through this? Do you think they're on the right path? It's a very complex situation that's never been experienced before. Um, both a huge health crisis and economic crisis at the same time, and and various other crises being being displayed. What are your thoughts about how we'll come out of this? You know, leadership is a is a tricky thing uh, to observe and to uh, understand how different people go about their role as leaders. Um, leaders aren't really truly tested until they're faced with a crisis that they didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. So we're into it on both those levels that, that you mentioned. Nobody saw the pandemic coming. I mean, I should kind of self-correct a little bit there. I mean, there's always been this fear of a pandemic and it's how a country is ready for it and how leaders are ready for it. Uh, that's important. But let's say nobody assumed that, well, 2020, that'll be the year of the pandemic. So we better get up to speed on that. They clearly, nobody was. So whether it was the pandemic or the impact that it's had on the economy and what happens in the future as it relates to the damage caused by the pandemic, both in health and in the economy, that these leaders will be judged. Um, I think it's probably it's probably too early to make hard judgments. I mean, what we're going to find over as we start to slide out of this, my own feeling is we're kind of at the halfway mark. We've got some ugly stuff to get through in the next few months. But by this time next year, we should be out of it. Uh, our lives will be different, but we'll be we're past certainly the worst of it, and we will to be into the recovery mode health-wise. Um, somewhere in this next year, we're going to start hearing the real stories about how this was managed and handled, and people are going to make some, you know, some hard judgments on this. Uh, whether they're the you know voters or whether they're uh, they're politicians, they'll be making judgments about how different people reacted, how different people handled the situation, and not just those in in roles of government, 
but also those in in, in 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 the opposition parties and how they've made their decisions about what they either attacked or helped or promoted. I mean, we're living in a you know in such a divided era. Um, you know, we we tend to think of that just as an American problem. Well, it, well, it's not. It's you know, it's a problem here too, uh, and you know, we see it every day. What I would like to think that I would like to wish is that that we could live in a in an era where there was some deep sense of cooperation at a time of crisis. We've had that before in our past, in our history. Uh, whether it was through coalition governments in the First World War or an understanding at other times when there was a national crisis hitting, that you have to work together and pull together, that there would be time for uh, debates and discussion about how issues were handled. But at certain times, there is a need, and it's not just a need to have things move forward, but it's a need uh, to influence the public, that there is a willingness to share uh, in the uh, in the dealing and the challenge that lies in front of you, um, I haven't seen that on on the part of the two main parties. I've seen it at times on the on the part of the NDP, um, but uh, so far the Conservatives who are you know have gone through this period of of um, you know changing their leaders and trying to do develop a new position on on issues. Um, they seem at times for me uh, to be struggling on that sense of trying to come up with um, being a cooperative and helpful uh, opposition party at a time of national crisis. The government and its leadership um, uh, issues will be determined by what we end up seeing. I mean, we've just witnessed in the, in the Ontario government, the Auditor General's report coming out uh, on a number of key issues that relate to how the pandemic was handled in its earliest stages. And they are not flattering to the government of the day. Uh, I would expect to see that happening in different parts of the country to, for other governments, uh, and certainly uh, at the federal uh, level as well. Was there a sense of cooperation a little more, say, six months ago? If there was, I don't recall that weekend going back. <laughs> okay, uh, here, here's a question from the audience um, relating to this question. How has the media handled the pandemic? Ah, well, there's, a, there's an interesting one uh, as well. Look, at, at a time like this, when the crisis hits, what do people want? They want information. They want information about how it impacts their lives, what they need to do, what they shouldn't do. Uh, who to trust, who's telling the truth. That's what the media should be trying to do, as well as its continuing sort of observation of the way things are unfolding. But its primary source is to try and deal in truth. Uh, we're, you know, we're living in an era where it seems truth doesn't mean that much anymore. Um, it's, and, and that, once again, is not just an American thing. Um, the uh, you know successful country is developed on the relationship between the people and their government, and there's a trust factor there. And trust is you know developed by um, by the, the the fact that the information flow is one that deals with truth. And I'm not sure that that is always the the, the case for us in terms of um, uh, of the relationship between the media and the people. And I say that because there's been a continuing kind of slide in the trust factor between the people and the media. Now, you got to be careful. The media is not a monolith. We all, news organizations all kind of operate yeah. differently and have different values and, and guidelines. But overall, the trust factor for journalists has dropped not just recently, but it's dropped over the last 10 or 15 years with the explosion in the uh, number of different media platforms um, and the, the, the partisan nature at times of how the media operates. This is, a, this is a dangerous position to be put in. I mean, we're seeing some of the results of that danger south of the border. We've gotta be careful we don't slide into the same kind of situation. Um, 
trust in the media is developed by the media being transparent about the way it operates. You know, how do we make decisions about what's news and what isn't? How do we decide what should be at the top of the program and what should be at the bottom of the program? How do we decide who to give anonymity to and who not to give it to? And why do we make those decisions? Um, I think for the most part, we tended to forget that part of establishing that trust with the uh, people is to ensure that they understand what it is we're doing. I mean, when you see the trust factors and the trust numbers and uh, and things have kind of gone upside down to a degree. I mean, and the one thing that's consistent is up at the top of the trust factor numbers are basically frontline healthcare workers, doctors and nurses and you know um, paramedics, fire, police. They're near the top and they've been consistently near the top. Um, journalists and politicians used to be kind of middle to sort of halfway towards the top. They're all below the middle now, at least in the in the charts that I look at. And some of them are, you know, in some cases, they're way down. You know, you're in trouble when when the used car trade, and I, I don't mean to offend anybody here, but traditionally, that's being near the bottom, used car salesmen. The smartest thing they did was they changed their name. You never hear used car people anymore. It's all you know previously owned automobiles. It just has a real classy sound to it. Um, anyway, they're in some cases above politicians. They're in some cases above journalists. Hey, this is not a, the direction that we should be heading in. So we have work to do. Having said all that, there's been some tremendous journalism through the pandemic because they've answered that question of information and helping people understand the yeah. uh, the issues in front of them. And, and a lot of it, uh, uh, Peter, I, I, to your point, has been um, journalists like like your your previous show, The National, have been um, having a series of Q and A sessions with with doctors and other medical experts, um, kind of an ask ask me anything kind of session. Right. Um, has that helped journalism overall as a result? Being able to bring them in and, and hear it from them directly? Yeah, I, I think it does because there's so much so much misinformation out there and there's such a lack of trust on the part of the public of certain parts of the kind of media picture. And in some cases, that's politicians. Um, in uh, in some cases, it's big company, pharmaceutical companies, so what have you. When you have a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic uh, sitting there answering the questions from uh, news anchors on you know CBC or any network for that matter, uh, there is a uh, an element of trust there immediately uh, on the part of the public. Now there. There are some people in the public who aren't going to trust anybody right now because conspiracies rage in, you know, not in the majority of, uh, of people, but certainly in a significant minority, one that we have to be aware of and try to help um, report in such a way that they watch and listen and hopefully change their mind or or at least give us the opportunity because it's it can get ugly out there. Okay, uh, Peter, let me ask you uh, another question. I'm combining one that I had with a question that's come in, um, and that's with regards to Donald Trump. Uh, does What does the the end of the Trump era, at least for now, at least for the next four years, mean for, for world affairs? And, and what will his legacy be with regards to COVID? So first, maybe just the end of, of Donald Trump, or the beginning of the Biden-Harris era. You know, I thought the most telling thing on the day they finally, the networks, finally declared Trump the winner. Remember, it was a Saturday, I think. Remember that, yes, Saturday morning. After the actual election. I thought the most telling thing on that day was the first people to recognize and, and you know, and accept that Trump had won were foreign leaders. Trudeau was one of them. Angela Merkel was one. Boris Johnson, who was supposedly a big friend of Donald Trump, was another. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, 
uh, who was clearly a friend of Trump's, all within the first few hours publicly announced um, their congratulations to, um, to Joe Biden. Now, what did that say beyond what normally happens around these things? They don't normally happen that fast. But I think it happened that fast that day because they knew, and I'm sure they'd all talk to each other in the in the days leading up. This this day is coming. We know it's coming. We got to be fast out of the gate because none of them like that guy. None of them like Trump. I remember interviewing Mulroney, Ryan Mulroney, two weeks before the election, and I asked him that very question: Will any of these key leaders of the uh, you know Western alliance, so to speak, be upset if Trump loses? And he said, not one. He said, I know them all, and not mm -hmm. one. And so the, on that day, the important thing for them was to get the word out right away that they were okay with what had happened, they liked what had happened, and they were ready to move forward with a new era. And that new era is important because you know, uh, as, as your viewers know, that this has not been a pretty situation between what were traditionally the great allies of the West whether it was NATO or, 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 or wherever, it's not been a pretty picture. And um, to try and reestablish the relationship between countries like Germany and France and Britain and Canada and the United States won't happen overnight. But it started to happen that day within literally within minutes of the TV networks um, yeah. the, that the people had made their choice. So that's an important indication that it's going to be different, but it's going to take a while because a lot's happened in four years. A lot of things have changed, whether it's trade patterns, like because of Brexit, uh, or or whether it's uh, you know military alliances. Any number of different things have happened that have changed the equation, and you don't you won't reestablish that overnight. Uh, and what's your sense of, of Canada-U.S. relations now? going forward you know listen we're, we're always the best of friends we're always going to be the best of friends um this has been a difficult time uh, between canada and the united states mainly because these two guys don't like each other and they haven't liked each other since day one and, you know, to quote Mulroney again, and, you know, Kretschens would say the same thing. If you want to establish a really good Canada-U.S. relationship, the two leaders have to be able to get along. They have to respect each other. They have to, they don't have to love each other, but they have to respect each other and not feel uncomfortable talking with each other. These two have, and that's been to the detriment of the relationship going both ways. Um, and believe me, from what I know, that that started off on the very first um, day when they on the very first phone call, which was a congratulatory phone call, and and, and it, it it had moments in it that uh, that, that signaled that this was going to be not a great relationship. Yeah, it's, it's a, can I just take you back to a really interesting um, um, expose you did when. Justin Trudeau, the first day he became prime minister, uh, you, you got an inside look at, at, at uh, what was happening there. It seems to me the world changed a lot for him over the next four years. Um, Donald Trump was elected. Uh, suddenly all the premiers who were friends of his changed and then mm -hmm. came along uh, COVID. Um, so he seems to have a much tougher role than he did than he did five years ago. Do you think Canada is a lot that his job or anybody's job as prime minister is a lot harder than it was five years ago? Well, it's definitely a lot harder. I mean, listen, he was, a, you know, he was really, you know, swimming in a pool. He had no idea of what it was going to be like. I mean, he may have grown up in those surroundings, uh, but you know, Andrew, he's not at all like his father was. Well, it, you're, you're not as old as me, <laughs> having covered them both. I mean, he, he, he's just not like his father. He's very different. And so the world in the five years since he uh, became prime minister and today has changed, you know, radically. But he's changed, too, not surprisingly. You know, he's older. He's more mature in the sense 
politically more mature. He's made mistakes, quite a few of them, which, you know, you learn best from the mistakes you make. And, uh, you know, so he's, he's actually in a better position to try and handle the challenges in front of them. Nobody would ask for these challenges. It's hard to imagine. You know, I, there was something that Brian Pallister, the Premier of Manitoba, said the other day, which I, I found intriguing. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily a big fan of Pallister's. I mean, I have connections to Manitoba, having spent a lot of time there, and I have family there. And I, I'm not sure that they've handled things all that well uh, during the, this pandemic. But having said that, he gave this speech the other day, and the mo most of the coverage was about you know, his plea to people to take this seriously, that it's a killer, that you've got to wear a mask, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. But he also said, he basically said, nobody's going to thank me for what I'm telling you today. I'm the bad guy. I'm taking Christmas away from you. He said, all I can hope for is that in the future, years down the road, that you respect me for what I've done. Well, you know, you don't say, you don't hear politicians say that or act that way enough because that's what it's really all about you get your moment in the sun you get your moment to be a leader whether it's a premier or prime minister a mayor um but you're not going to be there forever this is what trump never understood right you're not going to mm -hmm. be there forever. your time will come and go you'll either lose or you'll step down because you want to move on in your life but you will have done things during that period in office where you thought you were doing the right thing for the people you serve. And what could you hope for in the long run? You could hope that they respected you for what you did. They might not have agreed with you, but they respected you for what you did and the way you went about it. And I thought that was quite telling of Pallister. And I wish more, you know, more political leaders at all levels, levels of, of, of politics um, looked at that and learned from it. Because let me tell you, if I can, Andrew, one other thing. Because there is this sense that, you know, that, that, that there's such a battle always between the media and, and politicians or reporters or journalists and, and politicians. I've been doing this since 1968. I've covered a lot of politicians at all levels, you know, municipal, provincial, federal. And the overwhelming majority of these people got in it for all the right reasons. They actually believed in something. They thought they could change the system in a way that would benefit the people. You know, we could argue with the changes they wanted to make, but that's what they believe. And it's a thankless job. Right? Most people who enter politics lose, right? They don't get the nomination or they get the nomination and then they're in the next fight and they lose there. And what do the winners get? You know, the winners get, in the case of, say, federal politics, they get to leave home. They get, in some cases, to make less money than they would have made if they'd stayed in their jobs, all because they believe they could make the system better for others, right? And then they end up going to, in the federal case, to Ottawa. And they get chased down hallways by people like you and me demanding answers to questions that sometimes there really are no answers to. It's, it's in so many ways thankless, but in so many ways, if we didn't have them, if we didn't have these people who were dedicated to some form of public service, uh, we would be in dire straits. So as much as we challenge them and criticize them and throw them out of office at times, we're still damn lucky to have them. Wow, that's, that's really yeah, fascinating. Uh, I have one one closing question for you uh, that's come in, and it's it's a question I have on my mind too. So I'm really ha happy somebody asked it. Who do you wish you could have interviewed, but could not, living or deceased? <laughs> well, if you, listen, if it's, it includes deceased, there's there are lots of great names there, right? I mean, I would love to have interviewed Churchill. I would love to have interviewed Christ. I would have loved to have interviewed you know Muhammad. There are lots of people. Um, but in terms of living, uh, Trump, you know, I, I, yeah. I tried to interview Trump. Uh, I mean, I, I got an interview with Obama, with, you know, with a couple of weeks after he became president, which was a big deal. The CBC had never had an interview 
you know, a sit down one on one with the president, especially in the White House, uh, before in the history of the corporation, which is, you know, since the 1930s. So it was a big deal to get it. Um, but I got it because there were a number of ways we went about it, including I used some personal connections of, of shared friends that we had to get it. I tried to do the same thing with Trump and uh, I couldn't get it. You know, I tried to the whole year that he was running for the presidency and then the first year of his presidency when I was still in the anchor chair of the CBC. Uh, so I never got that. He did. He rarely gave foreign interviews, as you know, anyway. But um, but I would love to have been one of those who tried. Most of the people who, who tried end up in a, in a disastrous interview. But some of them have done really well. You know, like I think of Jonathan Swan from Axios had a terrific interview with him. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been a couple of others. But uh, most have sort of ended up in the, the trash bin of Trump history. <laughs> and, and and what's the first thing you would ask him? I would probably try to get at this whole issue of truth. Mm. Um, because the lie, guy's a liar. He, he just lies all the time. And try to go about a way of understanding what actually truth means to him. You know, and is there such a thing as truth as far as he's concerned? Because it doesn't appear that there is. But I, it would be an interesting discussion if he was willing to have it and i'm not sure how it would go the one thing i'm most proud of in the trump presidency is i was there for the inauguration as i'd been for you know obama's and other u.s presidents and i was there that weekend if you remember there's the inauguration was on a friday and on the saturday there was a big women's march it was an incredible march right. through washington and i left on the sunday morning the other thing that happened on the saturday was the beginning of the lies and it was about the size of the inauguration audience which right. seemed like a meaningless argument to have but nevertheless from the white house podium they just out and out lied and everybody knew they were lying and i can remember flying out of washington on the sunday morning 6 a.m was so a flight for from washington from reagan airport to toronto and i flew right over the you know as close as they let you get to the white house flying over and I, uh, I tweeted how, basically how depressing the moment had been to watch the highest officials in the US government, including the president, lie about something as simple as that. A fundamental, and I used the L word, at that point nobody else was, you know, we were all, they were all skating around and say, well, you know, it's not really a lie, it's kind of a falsehood, whatever, uh, I, I called it a lie and how it was attacking the fundamental pillars of democracy. And I took a lot of heat from that, including from my own, uh, my own news organization, but mostly from, the, from people who thought it was outrageous that I would say anything like that against the new president. But as I said, it's probably the one tweet I'm most proud of, of the, of the too many tweets I've sent in my life. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> If you, as we close, Peter, I just want to tell our, remind our audience that we have another session tomorrow evening at 7 with Professor Justin Guest from uh, George Mason University in Washington, D.C., where we'll be talking about polarization, and he'll be in conversation with former Premier Dalton McGuinty. So we'll be carrying on the discussion we've had today in terms of what's happening in the world. Um, there will be more sessions in January and February. Please keep in touch and, and, and join us again. Peter, I want to thank you very much for today, taking the time today and taking more time than, than your publisher allowed you to. I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for your service to us as Canadians. Um, what you've done over the years um, has really been very fair-handed as you've interviewed a lot of people with different viewpoints and allowed a lot of viewpoints to come forward, um, people who disagreed with each other. And I don't know whether they agreed or disagreed with you, but you give them all the forum to do that. Um, what you did was indeed give us a lot of good information, a lot of ability to, to decide what was the truth, and I think also helped uh, the status and the credibility of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which I think as a public broadcaster is a very important institution. So thank you for your service to date, and uh, please keep, keep on with, with the other projects you have. I want to hold this up one more time. Uh, thank you for this book, and um, all the best. Keep safe and take care.
Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, talk with your viewers. Pleasure.